Hi, I'm Dave Fornell, the editor of Diagnostic and Interventional Cardiology Magazine. I'm here at the University of Colorado to talk to them about the evolution of their mitral valve repair program. And I have with me to talk about this uh, John Carroll. He's the director of interventional cardiology. And Robert Quaif, he is the director of advanced cardiac imaging. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. For Thank you, Dave. Me. Tell me a little bit about how you got involved with uh, structural heart interventions for the mitral space. So first of all, we were involved early on in uh, the mitral balloon commissurotomy because that really was a um, landmark entry of transcatheter therapies into the mitral space. Secondly, we got involved in the Everest II trial, which was the a randomized trial against surgery, really a high bar. Uh, in terms of uh, comparing uh, transcatheter th therapies that were brand new uh, with no one very far up in the learning curve with something very well established, surgical mitral valve repair and replacement. We became involved because A, we were interested, we thought it was part of the future. Number two, we had the right uh, skill set uh, of I had learned transeptal catheterization, which was a skill that was kind of ancient but lost amongst most interventional cardiologists. I did part of my training in Zurich, Switzerland, where I learned it. Uh, secondly, we needed an uh, excellent image guidance person, and Dr. Quaif really satisfied that in that not only he was excellent, but he was interested in <laughs> image guidance. And thirdly, this was a comparative trial between a transcatheter and a surgical therapy, so we needed a cardiac surgeon who was open to the idea of comparing something that was so well established in surgery to a brand new therapy, was willing to do a joint mitral clinic with me in seeing these patients, and uh, was uh, willing to have them randomized between these two therapies. So that's how we got into the, uh, the mitral clip space uh, specifically. And uh, how many of these procedures do you do a year and uh, what are some of the tools and tricks of the trade? Well, we see a lot more patients than we actually perform the procedure. And I'd say currently uh, we're doing 30 to 40 uh, microclip uh, patients uh, a year. Um, some are in the commercially approved indication, which would be degenerative uh, mitral regurgitation for people who have prohibitive uh, risk and the others uh, have been in the co op trial and we're, continuing, we're in the continued access uh, part of that no, matter, no longer the randomized trial and that uh, really brings the fourth major collaboration to bear and that's an advanced heart failure group because FMR patients are typically seen in advanced heart failure. Uh, and so that, that's how uh, our current uh, volume uh, sets. In the, being a TCT 2018 uh, earlier this fall, uh, the COAP trial, I think, opened a lot of people's eyes to uh, maybe an entire new subset of patients uh, for the mitral clip in the coming years. It was huge. I, I'd say it's one of the major landmark events for transcatheter valve therapy to show a benefit that's not only people feel better, and stay out of the hospital more, but sometimes can you don't have to go on to transplant or bad, and show a mortality impact. That was outstanding, and that, that changed the field in many ways. And what is the role of advanced imaging uh, with the mm -hmm. mitral valve? Well, I think what's interesting is we trained 10 years ago um, how to do this as a research protocol, and I came out of the training with video systems and other things saying we need 3D imaging. We didn't have it at that time. And so that was one of the big thrusts to come out and be able to get 3D TE imaging over the next couple, three years to be able to do this because it actually took multiple views in and out of the stomach, back and forth to be able to accomplish the technology. <clears throat> With 3D imaging, we were able to actually use the human brain and eyes to be able to move a structure, know that it was moved in the right or wrong position, and then adjust it. So it really allowed eye-hand coordination, allowed a form of biofeedback to get much faster steering, much faster identification of abnormal structures and where we want to target the valve. And so not only did we <clears throat> learn how to do that 
uh, from the standpoint of steering, but then we could learn how to pre-evaluate patients and understand where our anatomy was, what was the pathology, what we needed to do uh, to structurally repair the valve. And I think those are the key pieces of imaging that has evolved now into a technology that we can use both image guidance and fluoroscopy fused together to be able to guide these procedures and be able to know where we are in 3D space. And you had mentioned, Dr. Carroll, that uh, you review quite a few patients and only uh, some of them are selected to go and actually get the, the transcatheter procedure. Do the rest of these uh, mitral patients, do they go to your surgical side then? It's a great question. It, uh, it's a testament to the diversity of mitral valve disease, number one. Uh, it's very different than aortic stenosis, which has few variations on the theme. Mitral regurgitation as well as mitral stenosis have a wide variety of variation. So it's for a select subgroup of patients that the uh, CLIP technology is appropriate for. And it's also uh, currently approved for people who would be at prohibitive risk of surgery. So those are two of the main things that may or may not be met when we meet with individual patients. But the advent of other transcatheter therapies that will be able to uh, tackle some of these other anatomical subsets is uh, now upon us and active in a variety of different clinical trials. And the CLIP is actually just a repair device. It's mimicking a, a surgical suture uh, repair. But with the uh, new devices that are coming online, there's numerous companies that are developing uh, transcatheter mitral valves. Uh, where do you see this going and what trials are you involved in for that? It's moving slower than the transcatheter aortic area did because of these complexities, I think, uh, requiring matching a therapeutic technology to the patient's anatomy in a way that we just didn't have to do as much in, in the aortic uh, space. So we're involved in both uh, further extensions of the reparative technology, both uh, via co-apt, but also now we have the Pascal technology coming from Edwards that has a, uh, a different approach uh, that has some uh, potentially significant advantages and, and that's going to be worked out in a randomized uh, trial comparing MitroClip with Pascal. Uh, Tendine is uh, a company that's now with Abbott, that's a transcatheter mitral valve replacement technology that's transapical. Again, we return to our key collaboration with cardiac surgery. They do the transapical access. Dr. Cleveland's an expert in doing VADs for many, many years, and now that skill set can be brought uh, to bear w with, with that. And so there are other uh, different kinds of reparative technologies that we'll see how they evolve in the, in the mitral space. Um, the patients um, often reside with family docs, general practitioners, general cardiologists, and uh, part of the challenge in these trials is enrolling patients, is, is finding them and know, letting these patients and the referring docs and other clinicians know that there are new uh, therapies that uh, may, may take someone who just couldn't have open heart surgery and now have a, a transcatheter approach. So there are a lot of moving parts to make this advancement in mitral space uh, continue on. In, as an operator, what are some of the skill sets that you need in order to be able to do uh, a mitral clip procedure or some of these other procedures? Uh, transeptal punctures is the first that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, I think uh, starting to understand uh, echo images in a way that uh, when I trained it was kind of binary, just they mean surgery or don't, don't they? Now you have to understand really the intricacies of the mitral valve apparatus in a way that uh, we just didn't have to do before because it wasn't applicable to what we were doing. So basic anatomy, and if you look at a lot of the training programs and courses, conferences, they're going back and having dissections of animal hearts. Mm -hmm. um, it's about imaging review sessions, looking at the various uh, pathologies. So those are some of the skill sets. Um, 
some of the procedures take uh, a long time, so you have to have a little stamina, too. <laughs> I mean, it's not the quick in and out uh, stenting a type A le lesion. It's a much more thoughtful process, which communication with the anesthesiologist, when you're repairing a mitral valve or that's regurgitant, you better make sure the blood pressure under general anesthesia is not 90 over 50, because the next day when they're awake, what you thought was a great result may not be. So working with the anesthesiologist has become uh, a new important uh, way that, you know, before didn't exist. So relationship building, I think, is a skill set that sometimes is underestimated in terms of uh, allowing these programs to uh, build in a, in a constructive way that we have fun and we're bringing great benefit to patients. Thank you very much for your time.